Guys, today we are going to cover chapter five, which is the working cell. But before we do so, let's have a little review on the plasma membrane. So we know that the major component um, of, a pla of a plasma membrane are phospholipids. And then these phospholipids are a type of fat. Um, we know that it has a polar head, which is hydrophilic and likes water, and hydrophobic tails that are nonpolar that do not like water. So our plasma membrane is oriented a certain way where you have two layers of this plasma membrane and you have the polar heads facing the outside water and polar heads facing the inside water where it is shielding these nonpolar hydrophobic tails. So this picture will give you um, a better understanding of our plasma membrane. So here we have our phospholipid bilayer. So two layers of those phospholipids, those molecules. And then inserted into our plasma membrane are called transmembrane proteins, or we can call them integral proteins. It just means that they're, they span the membrane or they're embedded inside the membrane itself. Now these proteins, they will have um, certain functions and we'll talk about those functions. Another type of protein that you'll find to support the plasma membrane are called peripheral proteins. And then these peripheral proteins that can be attached to a transmembrane protein or just the inside of the plasma membrane along with the cytoskeleton on the inside of the cell. Another molecule that makes up the plasma membrane are cholesterol. So cholesterol, what this function is that it helps to maintain the fluidity of that plasma membrane, the flexibility of that plasma membrane. We don't want our plasma membrane to be too flexible during high temperatures or too rigid during low temperatures. So this cholesterol will maintain optimal range of fluidity. Another type of molecule, organic molecule, you'll find are sugar chains on a protein, on a transmembrane protein. So here's your sugar, and then here's your transmembrane protein. So those are called glycoproteins. Or you can have a sugar chain attached to a phospholipid, and then those are called glycolipids. So these glycolipids and these glycoproteins, what they do is that they act as an ID tag for the cell. So a cell will have a certain type of glycoprotein or glycolipid to identify it as a liver cell. And then if it sees another liver cell, it'll say, hey, you know, come stick with me and let's make liver tissue. So there's a model to describe all this patchwork of different molecules and it is called fluid mosaic model. So fluid is referring to the flexibility of the plasma membrane. Mosaic means that it's just different compositions of uh, molecules, okay? So there are six functions to these transmembrane proteins. They're in your book, um, please read it, but for your exam, you only need to know three out of the six functions. So the first function that a transmembrane protein can take on is that it can be enzymes. And then enzymes are basically proteins that will act as a catalyst for chemical reactions. What does that mean? It just means that it will speed up chemical reactions. Another function of these transmembrane proteins or integral proteins is that they can act as a receptor to receive molecules from the outside of the cell. So for example, if you're eating something, you're ingesting glucose, um, your pancreatic cell will make and release insulin it will release the insulin into the bloodstream. And then here you can have a skeletal muscle cell receiving that insulin to tell itself, hey, there's insulin, um, no, there's glucose in the bloodstream. Let's take in that glucose, use it for cellular respiration so that we can make ATP, so that we can um, contract our muscles so we can exercise. <laughs> 
So the last function that you guys will need to know for this chapter is that these transmembrane proteins, they can act as transport proteins. And then transport proteins will help molecules that do not move through the cell membrane that do not move through the cell, main, cell membrane easily, and it needs some kind of help. So here it can act as a channel, or it can even act as a pump. <clears throat> so because of how the uh, phospholipid bilayer is oriented with its thick nonpolar hydrophobic region, the only types of molecules that can go easily into the cell or easily out of the cell are small nonpolar molecules such as these. So take for instance atmospheric oxygen molecule. Well we need it to easily easily go into the cell so that we can use it for cellular respiration so we can make ATP as soon as we need it. And then after we make ATP after we undergo cellular respiration well the cell is going to produce carbon dioxide in the cell and then carbon dioxide is toxic to the cell so it needs a way to easily go out of the cell so these types of molecules they are permeable they can go into the cell and out of the cell with ease um, since this is a large nonpolar hydrophobic region, another type of molecule that can go easily in and out of the cell is small lipids or cholesterol. Um, example is a cholesterol. Now those are lipid soluble that you know they can go in and out of the cell easily but for other types of molecules they need help and that help can come in the form of a channel or a carrier mediated protein so for channels, these channels will allow small polar molecules like water. Okay, so we, you know, we constantly need, need water to go into the cell and out of the cell. And then also ions, which are charged molecules. So for ions, we have sodium ion channels, potassium ion channels, calcium ion channels. Those all need help in the form of a channel to go in or out of the cell. Another type of protein, this one, it will allow large polar molecules such as glucose or proteins to go into the cell. So these two, these types of molecules, we say that they are impermeable. They are not able to go into the cell easily without the help of transport proteins. So your plasma membrane has what's called selective permeability where it only allows certain things to go easily into or out of the cell and then um, whereas others are you know will need the help of transport proteins. So there's two types of proteins. You can have passive transport protein or you can have active transport proteins. So your passive transport does not require any ATP or energy. Okay, So these will move through the plasma membrane with ease, without any help. And then in this picture here, we see here's the outside of the cell. And then this is the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm. And then what's dividing it is our phospholipid bilayer. And then these hexagon shapes, they represent small nonpolar molecules. So for instance, you know, here if we have a high amount of these particles, they are they will be able to diffuse or move into the cell easily. So here we have a high concentration gradient or a high amount of these nonpolar molecules and then they will go to a lower concentration where there's less until they equal out. So this is a form of simple diffusion where you know atmospheric oxygen can go into the cell easily. It'll go from a high concentration where there's a lot of them to a lower concentration where there's a less amount of them.
until they equal out. So for passive transport, we say that because it's going from a high concentration to a low concentration, it's going down its concentration gradient. Down its concentration gradient. And you can think of passive transport, um, an example would be if you're at the top of the hill, it'll be really easy for you to go down the hill because you're going along with gravity and it wouldn't take you any energy to go down the hill. Another type of passive transport that doesn't require any energy, any ATP, is called facilitated diffusion. So to facilitate something means to help. Okay, so and then they can come in the form of channels or carrier-mediated proteins. So for example, in this channel, we know that small polar molecules cannot go through the cell membrane easily because here we have the thick layer of fatty acids, that nonpolar region. So it'll need the help of a transport protein called a channel. And then ions will also need the help of a channel to go in or out of the cell. Another type of transport protein that is a part of facilitated diffusion are carrier-mediated proteins. And then these will allow large polar molecules to go into the cell. For example, glucose, amino acids, proteins, those are relatively large molecules and they are polar, so they would need help um, in the form of carrier-mediated uh, proteins. And then speaking of channels, um, we have a special type of channel that only allows water to pass through, and then these are called aquaporins. Aquaporins. Aqua means water. And then osmosis just means the movement of water, whether it's inside of the cell or outside of the cell. Speaking of osmosis, let's talk about how a cell would be affected by an outside solution. And then that would be called tonicity. Um, you know, when you place a cell in a certain type of um, solution, um, it can either cause the cell to shrink or burst, or if it's the right solution, it'll stay normal. So let's take a look at all of these three solutions or tonicities. The first one, let's talk about isotonic solutions. So iso means equal. And then here, imagine if we placed a red blood cell in a beaker that has the same amount of water on the outside and then the same amount of water on the inside of the cell and then the same amount of um, solutes or sodium chloride salt or even the same amount of glucose which is another type of solute on the inside of the cell is equal to the you know, same amount on the outside of the cell. If that's the case then water would go in and out of the cell where there's no net movement, um, no net loss or gain. So that means our red blood cells stays this uh, normal shape, that round circular shape with this concavity right there. So in our bloodstream, in our blood vessels, our red blood cells are floating or swimming through in an, in an isotonic solution. And then for salt, the isotonic solution is 0.9% sodium chloride. And then for glucose is a 5% glucose solution, 5% glucose solution. And then here in a hypertonic solution, so hyper means above. So in this outside solution, we have a lot of, you know, for instance, sodium chloride. So say we have a 10% sodium chloride on the outside. That's a lot of salt. It's kind of like eating a bag of chips. So what's going to happen is that you have a higher concentration of sodium chloride on the outside and a lower concentration of water on the outside. 
but inside the cell, you have a lower amount of sodium chloride, but a higher amount of water. So what's going to happen is that the water from the outside of the cell is going to flow out, out of the cell and into the solution. So what would happen to the shape of the red blood cell when that happens? Well, it'll shrink, it'll shrivel, and a special word that we say is that the red blood cell crenates. It crenates. And then the last tonicity or solution is called a hypotonic. Hypo means below. So it just means that on the, this outside solution, you have a less amount of sodium chloride, a less amount of solute. So for instance, you may have a 0% sodium chloride and then a high amount of water on the outside. But inside the cell, you'll have a high amount of, sol of solute or sodium chloride and a low amount of water. Well, water is going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And then that means that on the outside, it has a higher amount of water. The inside of the cell, it has a lower amount of water. So this water is going to passively go from the outside of the cell and then into the cell. And that's just osmosis. That's just uh, passive transport. So if water goes into the cell, that means the cell will gain water. It'll swell up. It can burst. It can lyse, and if it's a red blood cell, it's, um, it specifically undergoes hemolysis. Hemolysis, it'll burst. So these terms are relative to each other. Um, in this situation, this outside solution is hypotonic, whereas this inside solution inside the cell is hypertonic. And then here, this outside solution is hypertonic. It has a lot of salt. And then on this inside solution, inside the cell, it's hypotonic, where it has a less amount of salt. Um, you know, when you see these hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic, think of the amount of salt, uh, the amount of glucose, the amount of solute, um, and then think about the water that will flow in which direction. Okay. So that was your red blood cells. Let's talk about what tonicity or different solutions will do to a plant cell because it'll be a little bit different. So here in this isotonic solution, we saw that in red blood cells, that's what uh, red blood cells prefer. That's what animal cells prefer, where the shape of the red blood cells will be normal. But if you place a plant in an isotonic solution, where water will go in and out of the cell to have no net movement of water, you actually get a plant cell that is flaccid, where it's wilted a bit, because plants love water. Here, in this hypertonic solution, where this outside solution has a lot of solutes, and the solute can be sodium chloride or glucose, and a little bit of water, what's going to happen is that the water from the, from the cell is actually going to go into the outside solution. And then you get your plant cell shriveled up, and then the plasma membrane will start to retract away from the cell wall. And then the plant, it'll plasmalize plasmalized. So here, this plant cell does not like a hypertonic solution. This is basically what happens when you don't water your plants. Um, the plant cells will plasmalize. However, the plant cell, it prefers, it loves a hypotonic solution. So in a hypotonic solution, on the outside, what you get is a high amount of water and a low amount of solute. So that means this high amount of water is gonna go into the cell where there's a low amount of water. So it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration, passive transport, okay? So this water is gonna go from the outside 
into the cell where it'll fill the cell and then put some pressure against the cell wall and then makes the cell turgid, turgid. So this is a normal situation for a plant. This is what happens when you water your plants. Um, you get that plant that is upright and plump. Okay, so that was passive transport that doesn't require any energy that goes um, from a high concentration to a low concentration, what we call down is concentration gradient. So now for the opposite, we have active transport. So active transport means that it does require energy. It does need ATP to work. Um, because for active transport, what you're doing is going from a low concentration to a high concentration. That's not the tendency, that's not the norm. So that means that we need some kind of energy to go against its concentration gradient, against its concentration gradient. And then a really good example of this active transport is your sodium potassium ATP ACE pump. And then these pumps, um, they're important for your nervous system so that neurons can communicate with each other. And then also it's important for muscle contractions. That's, so those are what these pumps are used for. So normally in these situations, what you have is a high concentration of sodium ions on the outside of the cell, extracellular fluid. So extracellular means that is on the outside. So you have a high concentration of sodium ions on the, on the outside. And then here, on the inside of the cell, you have a high concentration of potassium ions, potassium ions in the cytoplasm on the inside of the cell. So what this pump does is that it'll pump more sodium chloride from the inside to the outside of the cell. So it's pumping from a low concentration of sodium chloride, of sodium ions, sorry, sodium ions, a low concentration to a high concentration, and it will need energy to do so. And then here, where there's a low concentration, concentration of potassium ions, it'll pump potassium ions from the outside of the cell into the cell where there's already a high concentration of potassium ions on the inside. So this active transport goes from a low concentration to a high concentration. Another type of active transport is called bulk transport and there's there's two types of bulk transport. So bulk transport just means that you are moving things into the cell or out of the cell in bulk, in large amounts. Um, the first one is called endocytosis. Endo means in, and then cytosis means a cell's condition. So this is when you're bringing something large or something with a great amount of inside of the cell at once. And then there's two types that you guys will have to know. One is called phagocytosis, and then this just basically means cell eating. And then this happens when you have a food vacuole. So for example, if you have an amoeba, an amoeba, which is a protozoa, it'll take in food from the outside. It'll package this food, engulf that food, undergo phagocytosis, engulf that food, package it in a vacuole, okay, and then digest it. Um, another example is if you have a white blood cell, so imagine if this is a white blood cell and then this is bacteria, well that bacteria will undergo phagocytosis by the white blood cell, get packaged in a, in a vacuole, and then where it'll meet a lysosome, and then that lysosome will release its digestive enzymes to break down that bacteria. And another good example is that you can undergo phagocytosis, um, you know, you have damaged organelles, okay, where the lysosome will meet it as well and then break down its parts to be recycled. And then another example of endocytosis is called penocytosis. Um, and then this is often referred to as cell drinking. 
where you have the outside of the cell and then here's the inside of the cell. And basically the cell is just drinking in the extracellular fluid where it'll contain some sugar or protein and it'll just package it in a vesicle to be used. The other type of bulk transport is called exocytosis. Exo means to exit, to leave, and then this just um, a really good example is when your pancreatic cell has made insulin that needs to be secreted out of the cell. So here you have this secretory vesicle that just came from the Golgi apparatus of your pancreatic cell and then inside that vesicle you have insulin. insulin. So what's going to happen is that this vesicle is membrane bound so that means that this membrane that's made of phospholipid is going to fuse with the plasma membrane of the cell so that it can release so that it can release the contents out of the cell. So now it's releasing insulin hormones into the bloodstream. So insulin hormones are a good example. Um, neurotransmitter, this could be a nerve cell where it has neurotransmitter proteins inside the secretory vesicle to be released by exocytosis. Another good example is digestive enzymes where this can be a stomach cell and then inside the vesicle are digestive enzymes that need to be released into the actual stomach to meet with the food, to break down the food that you just ate. So this, this is my writing, excuse the poor handwriting, but this is just a summary of what we just talked about, um, the cell transport, you know, where we compare passive transport and active transport. I like flow charts, and then this way, it kind of just summarizes everything for me. So on this side, we have passive transport. And then we know that passive transport doesn't require any energy, any ATP, um, because it's going from a high concentration to a low concentration. And we call that down its concentration gradient. So these brackets um, symbol concentration. And then... An example of passive transport is the simple diffusion where it can go through the cell membrane with ease, without any difficulty. And then these are for small nonpolar molecules like these. Another type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion where it needs the help in the form of a channel or a carrier mediated protein. So these channels will transport small polar molecules like water, and then you also have ions. Um, and then here you have carrier-mediated proteins that will allow large polar molecules such as glucose or amino acids, proteins, to go into the cell. So that the side is passive transport. On the other side, let's compare it to active transport. So active transport uses energy, ATP, because we're going from a low concentration to a high concentration, and we call it against its concentration gradient. And then the examples that we use is the sodium potassium pump, endocytosis, where you're taking things in, in bulk into the cell, and then you have under endocytosis, you have the examples of, pass, uh, of phagocytosis and pinocytosis. And then the opposite of endocytosis is exocytosis, where it is um, releasing uh, contents in bulk out of the cell. Okay, so in this class, we're going to talk a little bit about physics. Not too much, but just a little bit. So one definition that's important to know is energy. Energy is the capacity to do any type of work. You know, if you have energy, you can do things. Um, and then there's three types of energy. So the first one we have what's called kinetic energy, and then KE is just abbreviation for kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is energy in motion. So when you are moving up, you know, when you're up and about, it's kinetic energy. But you can transfer this uh, kinetic energy to another object. So for instance, 
This is a picture of Tiger Woods. Um, here we see that he's about to swing his golf club. So that's kinetic energy, energy of motion, movement. And then when he hits the golf ball, he's going to transfer his kinetic energy to the golf ball and make that golf ball fly, go a long distance. And then another type of energy is potential energy. So potential energy is stored energy in the structure of bonds, the structure of a molecule, or even the location of a molecule. So for instance, it's a silly example, but this dog here, he has potential because of his structure the bonds of his molecules. So here, his potential energy, he can transfer that potential energy, transform it into kinetic energy when he moves his paw and turns the steering wheel of a car to turn the car. And then to some things more related to our class here, um, take the equation for cellular respiration, the process of it. So we know that cellular respiration, we are taking a molecule of glucose and turning it into ATP energy. Well, this molecule of glucose, because of the bonds in this molecule, it, there's potential energy in there. And then when we break those bonds, we release the energy and turn that energy along with atmospheric oxygen. We turn that energy into chemical energy called ATP. ATP. So chemical energy is the potential energy release, basically. And then now cells can use this ATP to do things to sustain life. There's two laws for thermodynamics, and then thermodynamics is just the study of how energy is transformed from one type to another type. So the first law is called law of energy conservation. Um, it basically says that the energy in the universe is constant. It's not changing. The amount is not changing. Um, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed third as this example with tiger woods or transform as this example in cellular respiration where we're taking the potential energy of glucose and turning it into uh, chemical energy in the form of atp another example of energy transformation is the process of photosynthesis where we take carbon dioxide and water along with solar light energy. So the solar light energy is a type of kinetic energy, okay, because it's moving, kinetic energy. We take this kinetic energy along with these molecules and we transform it into glucose. And then that glucose in photosynthesis will represent chemical energy, chemical energy. The second law is about what's called entropy. And entropy is just the disorder of molecules or the randomness of molecules. In order for chemical reactions to occur, we have to break bonds and then, you know, kind of change up these molecules. And what we do is that we create disorder. We create entropy. So for example, in this picture here, we have two types of dots, two colored dots, and we have a partition. If we remove this partition, all these, the red and the blue, they'll get kind of mixed up. Well, what we're doing is we're causing disorder, we're causing entropy, and then that's what has to happen when a process occurs, when a chemical reaction occurs. Uh, for example, cellular respiration. So here, this molecule of glucose and then this molecule of oxygen, well, what we have to do is create entropy, disorder, and rearrange these bonds 
so that we can make different types of, molecule, of molecules. So for instance, carbon dioxide, water, ATP. And then in a lot of chemical reactions, what we produce is called heat, especially in cellular respiration, we produce a lot of heat. And then this heat is just energy that is lost into the universe, but it's still in the universe, so energy is still constant. But this heat is in an unusable form. We cannot use it. So we say that it is lost. There's two types of chemical reactions. The first one we have is called endergonic reactions. And then these endergonic reactions requires the input of energy. It requires that chemical um, reaction. It needs some type of energy to go into it to make the products. So for example, a really good example of an endergonic reaction is photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, we start with these reactants or molecules that have low potential energy. So carbon dioxide, water, you know, there's not much energy in these molecules. Um, and then what we do is that we have the input of solar light energy so that we can make a molecule of glucose that has high potential energy, high potential energy. And now the plant cell can use this glucose for um, cellular components, um, cellulose, the cell wall, or they can even use this glucose and break it down for cellular respiration to make ATP. So what you have are these low potential energy reactants. You put in some energy, and then what you make as a product is a high potential energy molecule. That's an endergonic reaction. Another example of an endergonic reaction is the making of ATP. So in ATP, what you have is this high energy um, molecule, but the reactants are what's called ADP, adenosine diphosphate, where it only has two phosphate groups, and then you add another phosphate group along with some energy. So these are lower potential energy reactants to make a high potential energy product. And then the energy now is stored between the phosphate groups, especially this terminal phosphate bond right here. And then so the cell, after they've made the ATP, whenever they need energy, what they're going to do is break up or hydrolyze this phosphate bond here and extract that energy to do whatever it needs to do. The opposite of endergonic reaction is exergonic. So endergonic, you are putting in energy. Exergonic, you are releasing energy. Releasing energy, the output of energy. And then kind of the opposite of photosynthesis, you have cellular respiration, where you start off with a high potential uh, reactant, such as glucose. So remember, this has a lot of potential energy because of the bonds in the structure of glucose. And then as the products right here, what you get are low potential energy products. So you have carbon dioxide and water, and then yes, there's a lot of energy in ATP, but relatively compare it to glucose, it has lower potential energy than glucose. So these products are lower energy, but you are releasing energy from this reaction, from this process. You've, you've extracted energy. And then another example of exergonic reaction is the breaking down of ATP. So here, ATP is a high potential energy molecule. And then we hydrolyze or we break the bond between these two phosphate groups. And then what you get is ADP, P, and then the release of energy, the release of energy. So these are low potential energy products and you get the release of energy. So this is an example of exergonic reaction. Then to categorize things even more, we have what's called anabolic and catabolic um, 
uh, reactions. And these are just a part of metabolism where, you know, metabolism, it just includes all of the chemical reactions in your body. So here, anabolic, it just means when you are building up a complex molecule. And then a good example of anabolic reaction is photosynthesis. So remember in photosynthesis, we start off with these simple, these low potential energy molecules. We put in some energy and we make this complex molecule like glucose that has a lot of potential energy. So photosynthesis is an anabolic and an endergonic reaction. So anabolic, when you're building up a complex molecule. The opposite, you have what's called a catabolic reaction. And then catabolic is when you are breaking down a complex molecule. And then a good example would be cellular respiration. So in cellular respiration, we start off with this complex molecule um, of glucose that has a lot of potential energy. And then what we get at the end of the reaction are these simpler, these low potential energy uh, molecules. And then we get the release of energy. So these catabolic reactions can be correlated with, with exergonic reactions. So here, this just sums up what we just talked about. Um, so, you know, definition of metabolism, it can be uh, divided into anabolic, okay, and catabolic. But reactions that I want you to associate with anabolic reactions are endergonic reactions, we just talked about. And then here, going back to chapter three, dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis. So remember, dehydration synthesis is when you are um, putting together monomers to make a polymer. So what are you doing? You're building a complex molecule. And then here, um, catabolic uh, associated with exergonic reactions, and then also hydrolysis reaction, hydrolysis. So remember, catabolic, you are breaking down a complex molecule. And then here, hydrolysis, we learned in chapter three that you are breaking up a polymer into monomers by using hydrolysis. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about in chapter five are enzymes. So enzymes are mostly proteins. Um, what enzymes do is that they act as catalysts and then they speed up chemical reactions to make it go faster. And then with every chemical reaction, there needs to be some kind of initial energy input to get the reaction going. And then that initial energy needed is called activation energy, activation energy. And then this is just abbreviation for it. So this activation energy is needed to start a chemical reaction. And then you can think of the activation energy as a barrier as a barrier. So here we have reactant, okay, and then the beginning of a chemical reaction, well, it needs a lot of energy to get started, to get going, to proceed to the product side, okay. So here this picture represents without an enzyme where this energy is a lot, this barrier is high, but if you have an enzyme, what it does is that it'll bind or bond to the reactant, put in energy. So now the activation energy that is needed to start a chemical reaction is lowered, is lowered. So these enzymes, what they do is that they lower this activation energy barrier to make the reaction go faster. To make the product uh, to make the reactant side proceed to the product side faster, and then these enzymes they can be reused. Um, we don't just use an enzyme once and then just throw it away. We use them over and over and over. So let's look at how an enzyme works more in depth. So here we have an enzyme. Okay. And then an enzyme, what it has is grooves that is called an active site. 
an active site. And it's in this active site that the reactant will bond to, will sit into. And then reactants in this case are specifically called substrates. Substrates. So here, the substrate will sit into this active site. And then in this example, our substrate or, or reactant is called sucrose. And then our enzyme is called sucrase. So there's a feature about enzymes where they are substrate specific. It just means that the substrate of sucrose can only bond to this enzyme of sucrase. You know, we can't have the lactose substrate sit into the active site of this sucrase enzyme. So it's substrate specific. We have an enzyme for every type of chemical reaction, for every type of substrate. Okay, so now we have the substrate bonding into that active site in the enzyme. And then when that happens, the enzyme, what it does is that it'll stretch and strains the bonds in the substrates to lower that activation energy, to get it ready to go um, to proceed to in the chemical reaction. And then when it does that, the chemical reaction proceeds, and then this enzyme will break up those reactants, and then in this case, it'll be glucose and fructose. So the products are glucose and fructose. And then here, you know, something that we've actually talked about. So enzymes, because they're mostly proteins, they have um, optimal conditions. And then these optimal conditions can be optimal range of pH, optimal range of temperature, Okay, so for instance, you have digestive enzymes in your stomach that um, works optimally in a lower pH and an acidic pH. If you take those stomach, those digestive enzymes and put it in a basic pH, it won't function. What will happen is that that enzyme will actually lose its shape. And if it loses its shape, it no longer functions properly. So when it loses its shape, we say that the protein has denatured, denatured. So, so some environmental factors that can cause a, an enzyme to denature are changes in temperature, changes in pH, changes in salinity, which is changes in the salt concentration, 